Welcome to a series of podcasts created by the Experimental Film and Media Arts class at Universität der Künste in Berlin of Professor Nina Fischer in collaboration with curator Vanina Saracino and artist Lili Kuschel. The program brings together artists, scientists, curators and experts from other fields who inspired us to observe and reflect upon our surroundings, our surroundings in a critical, in a critical way. way. We inquire into new forms of research and artistic strategies and we are interested in a conscious shift of perspective. Perspectives that take a distance from anthropocentric world viewings and, and binary, binary thinking, thinking in a favor of a tentacular one. We share images, sounds, sounds experiments, experiments, moments, moments anecdotes, anecdotes and videos, videos and thoughts that enable us to expand our sensing and understanding of a world within, within a more than, than human dimension. dimension. One of art, a man in PC, but we never had the same as Rehot. This sounds really, really interesting, the Indo specifics, uh, but I didn't know it before, so I'll, I'll look into it a bit more. Cool, I only saw it as an um, installation, not as a performance, so it also works uh, without someone there. It was really impressive. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Maybe later you can also um, explain a little bit more about it, how you worked. Also, especially with this, uh, yeah, with both of the videos and with the language, because I think this was very impressive. And also, um, yeah, there's a lot of questions, maybe how this um, language was generated and how you worked, what was, were your methods? Yeah, um, explain a little bit more about the movies, and then we go into the discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we could. Um, I can, I can tell a little bit more about. So, with the gut machine poetry or the Nam Gut uh, video that there the, the kombucha culture works a bit like a random number generator, like a wetware random number generator. And the algorithm that's that's splitting up the, the words is based on Douglas Hofstetter's jumbo that's really actually made for solving anagrams. <laughs> but but it has this interesting um, like um, inspiration from the world of cells and enzymes so so the way that the le uh, letters and syllables come together and are broken apart uh, take inspiration from there um, and then um, with Nimi Asetti in terms of linguistics it was a, maybe a little bit and, and vocalizations it was a bit more um, how do you say it like a, a bit more advanced <laughs> approach a bit more intelligent uh, approach perhaps um, where maybe the the the, the God machine poetry is quite close to like some sort of cut up cut up poetry history from surrealists and so on, uh, but the 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 Nimi Aseti one based on machine learning. So 
there's actually, well, different kinds of algorithms. So as I mentioned, I, I worked uh, with Memo Akten and Damien Andre as part of this residency that I did. So Memo, and here the language generation was actually very vocal based um, and speech based, um, uh, unlike in, in, the, in the case of the, the uh, Namgat, it was actually more based on the, the jumbling of words. Um, and, and I just gave it a voice. Um, it was Jessica Edwards' voice who actually, um, who just read the, the input from the, the computer, but she actually has like a, like a family history in Glossolalia. <laughs> so she comes from a Pentecostal family. So I also thought that she would be the right interpreter for this material that came out. But actually the, the in the case of Nimia Seti, there are a few algorithms uh, at play. So there's something called Grandma that's developed by Memo Akten. And it's something that basically there's a system that looks at each frame of the video uh, where the bacteria are uh, portrayed under the microscope. And then it also looks at this series. I, I recorded these clips from Helen Smith's Martian, which I sort of bastardized <laughs> myself and spoke out um, according to Theodore Flournoy's analysis of Helen Smith's Martian language, it had a very interesting uh, syntax in itself, but it was also quite close to French, which was uh, Smith's uh, native tongue. So I probably also with my, my Finnish <laughs> interpretation managed to do something to it already. But anyway, I, I recorded these uh, takes like um, many, many, many uh, files, like short clips of, of that language. And then the, the grammar algorithm sort of combined each frame of this kind of bacterial movements or like constellation of bacterial positions with a certain sound clip um, as it saw best. So this is part of the sort of black box problem or the part of the unexplainable <laughs> uh, system that it had, that it, that it definitely had a system according to which it combined a certain frame with a certain sound but it's a bit hard to say what that system exactly was or is. But anyway, what came out like this was this really eerie sort of like chorus-like sounds in the back um, because the frames switch very quickly. And so the sounds actually layer over each other. Um, so it's this kind of buzzing hive-like sound almost. And then there's another way that's a bit more um, traditional way in machine learning or more usual to hear there's this kind of vocals on top um, uh, this kind of more more clear um, speech-like uh, part that's um, using um, sample RNN uh, which is a quite widely used uh, method in machine learning where uh, basically the machine would listen to everything that I fed into it all the sound clips and then produce more of what it has heard. So try to kind of mimic that uh, and use that material to generate more similar stuff. Um, so that was the vocal part. Mm. Then there's the other aspect of the written language, which is basically a little bit like if you, um, if you have a pencil that's attached to a piece of string, or you could imagine a pencil that's attached to a piece of string and, and then the bacteria under the microscope sort of pushing the pen around. So the, the kind of most powerful forces from the bacterial movements are pushing the pen around on the paper, paper. and then someone would be pulling a paper, <laughs> pulling the paper to one direction so that it becomes more like writing. So, so that's what happened with the, that's the writing part. So in a way it's not totally connected to the, the sonic part, even though of course conceptually very much, but, um, but it's, uh, it's another way of kind of describing the bacterial movements in this um, language-like form. Oh, great, thanks for the explanation. I think also this uh, going back and forth um, or almost like weaving, because you said you, all, you work like in chapters and you always come back to the chapters to, um, yeah, to go further or work for, further or to, to go more deeper into the subject. 
And I was thinking that going back to chapters or coming back to topics, it's also very much alike in, um, or coming back to thought experiments or thought forms. It's also what we do a lot uh, in science and also in arts. And uh, especially I thought about it when you talked about the lava lamps, because I remember that in the 90s, there was a big retro um, movement of these lava lamps. Suddenly they were uh, reproduced. Because actually they, they are rooted in the 60s and 70s with the drug experiment. Like in the 90s, there was this huge uh, techno futurism retro. It was a lot about brain research and artists worked about that. There was a chaos theory. Art and science was very uh, much popular uh, to work in this field. And the browser-based internet started. The term network was, um, was a very important and very popular term. And that time also people started to talk about Musail of a fungi, reading Donna Haraway, uh, William Gibson, uh, <laughs> science fiction say, uh, things. And also kombucha, kombucha uh, tea became popular. It was produced as a fashionable drink. And because it all, um, somehow this was all like... Um, how can you say like an urban like a legend it's when it's somehow started but now we have uh, incorporated term of network so i have the feeling uh, when we look back that it's so much incorporated in our daily lives that we are almost physically or also bodily uh, connected to this, these networks or computer networks right and um, okay. yeah thanks yeah but that's definitely like a, like a piece of history that I <laughs> I'm quite often like uh, inspired by. <laughs> also, I have my own um, educational history is, is in this kind of media lab. It was early two thousands, but but still sort of in that similar spirit, uh, like media art studies in Helsinki at the University of Arts mm -hmm. and Design, and. Um, and so that whole world and the history of digital media is very much sort of my my background also. <laughs> yeah, that's the slime mode where it's all <laughs> coming from. <laughs> yeah, the slime mode was actually like <laughs> encountering it in, this was already then like mm, 2015 or something like la later on, but but um, but that was really because I was also always inspired by sci-fi and uh, like a huge sci-fi fan, and and then I just encountered this slime mold, which was really like this this kind of the cyberpunk idea of wetware next to software mm -hmm. and hardware. Uh, I felt like oh my god, it exists and it's this ancient organism that's all in nature, and then that really took me to this kind of biological to the path of biological experimentation, like like encountering that organism because it it really I was like, wow, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and and then I've done a lot of these these uh, different biocomputing fermentation uh, yeah. things after then. Yeah, great, because now we are all back in these um, topics and terms and it's all around us. <laughs> yes, definitely. And because now yeah, it's also devel developed a lot with all these algorithms and yeah, the whole network and how everything's connected. So it's uh, also time to yeah, revisit these subjects and topics and to talk about it. Definitely. And Yenna, it's been wonderful to go back to, to your works and uh, watching them again. And I wanted to ask you if um, I know that you are now working on a project, on an upcoming project that is called Wet on Wet. Yes. Would you like to tell us something about it? Yes. So speaking of, um, but it's uh, something also that that um, came about in this kind of uh, art science context, because I've been doing a residency at the MIT, uh, which has now, of course, uh, due to the current conditions, been been this at distance residency for quite a while now but um but there i i collaborated with um someone called marcus j bueller who's a material scientist and and it was actually finding him at mit it's also funny because i've i've done so many of these kind of um just as it happens like i i got in touch with scientists before <laughs> starting from the slime mold work which led into more of these sorts of co collaborations. And, and this was one of these cases. So I was really curious about um, already in connection to Nimi Asetti and these other projects and my interest in sound. And, and um, I was really curious about this emerging, but still a very niche field of 
of sonification in the, the, the field of science. So, so basically what I've done in this kind of narrative way in, in, in Nina Setti or um, God Machine Poetry, but, but, um, but actually there are some um, lines of research that use sonification, uh, basically listening to microscopic or nanoscale phenomena as a, as a as a research method and and Marcus's was one of these there's a few different types of approach that I've encountered in that uh, field but I think that's very also in relation to my topics of this sort of research topics of sort of sensing the world beyond language um, I think it's quite interesting another very dominant uh, feature in the human world is like the sight <laughs> and vision. So you look at things through the microscope or through the telescope. But uh, but I think it's quite interesting and also for me personally, like very intuitive to to add the hearing <laughs> into this uh, spectrum. So so listen to things instead of always looking at them. Listen to changes in cells and and so on. But uh, but so I. Um, Marcus's approach to this was that, or is that um, he's um, sonifying even smaller um, scale life forms than than cells. So he's he's basically um, sonifying um, molecules. Like he was actually uh, really focused on proteins, but together with him, we selected this group of uh, so-called emotive molecules, which mean mainly neurotransmitters. So. Um, uh, there's, for example, the, the love and bonding hormone oxytocin or serotonin or growth factors. <laughs> so, so things that, that really these kind of processes um, in our bodies that affects our, our moods and emotions. And, um, and then we sonified these. So, so basically the, the idea of looking at life as vibrations, also looking at molecular vibrations like like um, things that that vibrate in the body, these tiny particles that then move around, causing certain vibes <laughs> in us, and uh, that's the the root of the project. And then actually, so there's gonna be it hasn't been released quite yet, but very soon there will be this video um, out on on the Eflux platform, um, where. Um, where you can actually see there was this other aspect to the project where, because it was going to be released first in this sort of context of um, home rituals. So things like a, it was supposed to be like a piece of art that you can experience at home uh, at these times. <laughs> so, so the idea was to also, because looking at life as, as vibrations um, brought to mind other sorts of scales of vibrations like waves, <laughs> not only in the body fluids, uh, these, these vibrations caused by these molecules, but there's also like waves caused by the wind and water and, and, and you could look at really life and the world through vibrations and waves and sound waves even like this. So the video portrays this experiment where, um, where the, the sonifications of these emotive molecules are actually causing ripples in, in water, like this kind of cymatics approach um, where you can kind of see sound um, by, by transducing it to, to vibrations and then depict it on, in water in this case. Uh, but then there's this other additional slightly esoteric uh, angle to the project that actually, if you like, you can also... Um, use these vibrations to to sort of activate your waters at home so <laughs> you could um you could play these these drone like um molecular sounds to to water for drinking bathing cooking um painting is what i'm doing in the <laughs> video and um then thus kind of like amplify the presence of these certain emotions in your in your life but yeah so this is what wet on wet is about and that the name comes from wet on wet watercolor painting which is something that i've done for my um like during the quarantines and and this whole pandemic i've it's been the kind of a way of meditation so it's this type of painting where you really paint with water or let the water lead the painting so it's like very abstract form of painting where the water kind of paves the way so this is, uh, in a nutshell, uh, what this project is about.
Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Do you, can you tell us when will the video be published on the eFlux platform? I think it's just a matter of a few weeks. I okay. also don't have the exact date. Um, it's a project called Survivance together with Guggenheim, actually. But um, it's um, it's going to have like so, several pieces um, as part of it. And this is one of them, all sort of functioning at home. <laughs> Should we, Nina, should we open the discussion to... Yes, I think we should do that. Yeah, thanks. And um, please keep us updated when it's out on Eflux so that we can also enjoy it at home. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> hey, Jenna, thank you for uh, those beautiful videos. It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, um, it was very, very inspiring. And what I didn't really understand, even though after you explained it, so that's what I'm asking, did you bring them like the videos and and the and the and the voice and and the movement of the bacteria did you bring them into a dialogue with each other where they then were talking with each other and then new new things were coming out of this or did you put them on each other yeah so basically the video, the, the microscopic video and uh, the sounds that you hear are, or, or the microscopic video in a way leads the sounds that you hear. So, so basically there was this, like a bunch of sound clips that I just recorded using my voice and, and reading whatever I could find of Helen Smith's Martian. And then there were the, the microscopic videos as you see them. And the other part that you see is the computer sort of analyzing the, the bacterial videos, like the, it kind of turns them into data. And, and so basically what happened in the sonic field was that there was this, this video that sort of worked as a score for how the, the machine combined my sound clips. And that's what you hear in the background, the sort of like layer type of sound, like this sort of humming chorus like sound but the vocals like the the top sound the sort of speech like sound that's just basically the machine listening to the to my vocalizations from helen smith's language so that's not connected directly to the to the bacteria feed and then the writing uh, is actually just based on 100 percent on the <laughs> on the bacterial video so and that in that case in in a way there is like an inspiration from because helen smith also wrote the martian language that she spoke uh, or there were these different seances where she just wrote like automatic writing and then seances where she just spoke so so similarly they're not always totally interwoven but but there was the kind of a martian um writing also from Smith, but that is just like a visual reference. It doesn't it doesn't look exactly the same as this bacterial script or calligraphy. <laughs> interesting, yeah. I think it would be maybe interesting to see what happens if you uh, put a feedback system in it. That you know that the bacteria are reacting like through, I don't know, late light changes go on to bacteria, all this kind of stuff that that you can actually see a, a conversation. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it is like, as I mentioned, that the video is kind of a documentation of several experiments with this material. So there's also a lot of editing there. Like, and that's also something that um, as an as an artist working in this <laughs> slightly scientific or technological fields, you can have the liberty to do so there's a lot of uh, for example i work with uh, these wind instrumentalists like the contrabass recorder player and also um flautists and just use their breathing to kind of like breathe life into the machine or or this kind of you also hear these sounds like these more like musical sounds in the background and that's just my interpretation basically so so there is a lot of this sort of storytelling and and fiction also there but there are these kind of machine learning processes in this case that that also go into it may i ask more general question certainly as a japanese uh i couldn't find the possibility of konbuchai while i was in japan so it was amazing um mm -hmm. i'm interested in uh, your making process like for example, like the second work you showed, um, what kind of task or what kind of like process you did for your second work and how long does it take or what is the content of the 
task or like process itself? And how did you decide the your work finished? I mean, like, how did you decide your ending scene or like? For example, your second work seemed to me like I kind of saw your work. I thought like I couldn't make like this work ending like. Yeah, yeah. good questions. <laughs> it certainly I feel like a lot of my work is some sort of a performance or like a time based activity <laughs> that goes into it. And it is true that it's quite hard to. There are all these experiments, all these discussions, all these collaborations that go into it. And then at some point I will edit it into a video, for example, or a sound piece, or I will present it in an installation or something like this. And it is, of course, like um, quite often it's a question of, <laughs> of a deadline, but uh, for showing some of these experiments somewhere, because um, actually in the case of Gut Machine Poetry, which I think you refer to, um, the second work that was actually shown live online originally uh, as part of a show at, at the uh, Contemporary Art Museum Kiasma in Helsinki. So there were a few months where the, the kombucha culture was running at my studio and a new language was generated um, live online. Uh, and then after that period ended, it was a bit of a um, as often my, my processes or, or this sort of bringing like a biological process into a um, exhibition space or even your studio like in this case it wasn't even in an exhibition but it was in my <laughs> my studio but it meant that I had to like because I, I didn't have this kind of a very advanced equipment or like an access to to the most recent microscopes or so on so I had to change the sample of the kombucha <laughs> culture in the microscope quite often so it really was like this month long performance where <laughs> at my studio i was changing this kind of like kombucha sample like very frequently and uh, it needed to end at some point <laughs> because because i also couldn't keep doing it forever and then i i made it into this video after the show had closed in the case of nimia seti same applied to my residency so it was actually created as part of a residency at Somerset House Studios in London. And I had the opportunity to work with these um, machine learning experts uh, in that context. And basically we had a certain time together that was provided by the Somerset House Studios. And then the, the kind of experiment took shape during that time and then was documented in this video. So quite often it's this kind of slightly boring <laughs> or, or <laughs> institutional timeframes that that uh, decide for me um, that there's some sort of yeah like a residency there's an exhibition and then I often it's also because I've also even with showing the slime mold in an exhibition context it's it's difficult with biological materials and samples because in the lab you could kind of keep them clean and <laughs> and, uh, and and uncontaminated by other organisms uh, more easily but when you bring them into an exhibition space, it becomes like this pet because it's never 100% clean, for example. And and you need to sort of like, um, like it's very rare that you can have these kind of stable experiments for quite a long time. So even the slime mold labyrinths, for example, they've been, I had to take care of them. Like they were kind of performances of a week at, at, um, at a time and performances by the slime mold <laughs> in this kind of architecture that I built for it. And then I had to change it after that even though for example the slime mold is like a very amazing creature to work with because it's basically immortal so you don't have to kill it like or discard it after uh, an experiment but you can always dehydrate it <laughs> it it survives even this kind of hibernation state so um so yeah maybe hopefully this answers a little bit um your question or questions thank you thank you for the questions <laughs> Thank you very much, Jenna. Jenna, I would like to ask a question that is about the materiality in your videos that struck me insanely, or let's say it felt very haptic for me. And I would like to know what your working process is like uh, as well, or more the exploration of the materials. Mm. So do you also work with objects and sculptures to also understand this microcosmos and also this distance and... Um, I don't know, I'm working at the moment with uh, epoxied rain, um, epoxied resin and of course it is not very res um, sustainable 
and of course I'm aware of it, but sometimes it's really hard to find an um, alternative material, like to show what you want to show or what you what you want to tell. But for example, your work with the heads, uh, that was made out of glass, right? Yeah, no, this is a really good questions, all of it. The, the heads are glass, and in that case, it's like... Um, a chemical reaction because it's the lava goo, <laughs> the, the the lava lamp goo, which is basically this kind of paraffin fax and wax and, um, and and this kind of saline solution around it that's colored. Uh, so it's a bit easier to uh, maintain and upkeep <laughs> uh, while it has this kind of randomness to some biological materials too. But uh, that's similar to to them. But because a lot of this, like I, I mentioned, that they're sort of performative works in some way, or they quite often have some sort of living element to them or changing element to them, uh, that materiality is actually like a like a big question to me as well. And and somehow I often end up in these kinds of enclosures, like the the plexiglass mazes or the heads, the glass heads kind of like translucent <laughs> enclosures <laughs> quite often but then I also and it's a difficult I also actually uh, worked with epoxy a little bit but also found it a bit like you can freeze things inside <laughs> but it's not very ecological and also they're really gonna kill the your collaborators <laughs> or co-creators so um, so I've been trying to find this so I've made some works that are then more symbolic of the processes that are maybe not containing the, the, the biological mat material in itself. Also video and image has worked as, as a very important part of the, the practice with the biomaterials, because usually that process, it can hold for a week or more. <laughs> and then uh, if you want to kind of show it afterwards, it's, it's really good to um, have something like a, uh, like video or or um, image or or something almost like performance documentation too. So, so um, but definitely um, there is this side to my practice as well that's more sort of object oriented or physical sculptural. Um, but they somehow need to like finding these ways of coexist because on the level of practice, I'm really curious about these sort of chance elements and these sorts of more than human life forms interfering with the work. So. So somehow f finding that balance is a big part of my <laughs> sort of uh, question <laughs> questions. <laughs> I know this Philip uh, would like to ask the last question. I sadly also have to go very soon. So maybe we should do that. And thank you, Lisa. Very good uh, question. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jena. Uh, at the thank you, you for muted. granting me the last question, even though we already said it was the last question. <laughs> Um, uh, at the beginning, you said that you you take in the the, the slime mold, and then in your performances, then it become you become like both both of you are doing it, and I found it super interesting because I'm trying uh, I'm experimenting with exactly the same approach, just with a different non-human, and that's why I wanted to ask you how do you um, how do you identify when the when the slime mold is doing something? How is it? How is that? Yeah, uh, this is a good question. It's also like, how do you identify when your gut brain is working <laughs> or it's working all the time, but you might not be able to separate it from whatever you're doing <laughs> in the head brain. But um, with slime mold, um, so its effects are not immediate. I believe like that it works on a different time scale from us humans a little bit <laughs> that uh, sadly even though the the image that I showed you it's this kind of like a blotter uh, reference it doesn't work like immediate that I, I I feel the slime mold presence but then on the other hand I've been thinking that because it likes the dark and moist uh, places and bacteria to eat that it might still be living somewhere in my body because I've done this quite often <laughs> and maybe I will see its effects on the long run or whenever slime mold takes over <laughs> i hope i'll be on its side but but the i'm not sure how it reacts to stomach acids to be honest so that's another experiment that i would be curious to make in a lab um if it would survive them it's very sturdy but but i don't know exactly so it's more like a long-term collaboration but at the same time like the just getting to know about the slime mold has really changed my my idea about the world <laughs> already permanently so 
it has had these sorts of quote unquote psychedelic effects for sure. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Yeah, right. thanks, Dana. For thank you. you so much. We really enjoyed it. And thank you uh, for having me. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. And we will follow your work, also yes. the wet on wet, as soon as it's uh, published. And and looking forward to, yeah, seeing how the course develops and and hopefully seeing all of your work in the future. <laughs> for sure, we will have another uh, chance to meet in the future. Great, I hope so. Okay, have a nice day. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you.